touching me. She's touching me. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching me. Not touching. Touching me. It's free air. Ew! Would you <laughs> add it? Hey everyone, tis I Niche. I know I usually start my videos with like a fun little sketch just to ease us into things, but frankly, I've been a bit too exhausted to do so lately. A few months ago, I confided in some close personal friends that I'd never actually played the first Crash Bandicoot on the PlayStation 1 in the- Niche! Oh Niche! Have you played my game yet? Well, as you could tell, word got out about it. It's a simple question. Are you a man? And if so, why haven't you played it yet? For the last time, will you leave me alone? It's like 3 a.m. and I've got places to be, man. Which is why you're in your basement by yourself talking to a support beam, right? Yeah, well, I bet the neighbors hate what you're doing and they really want you to stop. We, we don't. don't. What? Why? Because, because you, you haven't played Crash Bandicoot before. Well, if you guys give me the chance to explain, you'd understand that I actually played through a decent amount of the first game on my Nintendo Switch. Nobody cares, Niche! Just play the game! Play it! Play it! Play it! Play it. <sighs> Fine. Whatever. Released in 1996, Crash Bandicoot is a linear 3D slash 2.5D platformer for the PlayStation. Developed by Naughty Dog, it stars the titular Crash Bandicoot on a journey to rescue his girlfriend Tana from the evil Dr. Neocortex and Dr. Nitrous Brio across nearly three dozen levels of hair-pulling action. While it wasn't one of the PlayStation's launch titles and even missed the US's launch window by a full year while it was at it, the game is synonymous with the hardware's first run of killer apps. And even though Crash became a multi-platform character in the early 2000s, he was basically Sony's mascot for their 32-bit console back in the 90s. In the same way that Sony's competitors at Nintendo had just used Mario to showcase the 3D capabilities of the N64 back in June 1996, Crash quickly became the game that PlayStation fans pointed to when trying to prove their console superiority against the competition. As for the company that made it, they got their start back in 1984 as Jam Software and had focused on making PC games for stuff like the Apple II, Amiga, Atari ST, and DOS until they changed their name to Naughty Dog in 1989. Their first home console game, Rings of Power, came out just two years later for the Sega Genesis and was followed up with 1994's 3DO title, Way of the Warrior. Unfortunately for them though, both games failed to really leave their mark on audiences and faded into relative obscurity after receiving mixed to negative reviews from critics and players alike. However, their third game, the one you're presumably here to watch a retrospective for, would serve as the title that would launch them into the big leagues. Upon its release, the majority of gamers out there would set aside their Discmans that were probably loaded with no doubt Spice Girls and Fuji CDs in order to make Crash Bandicoot one of the most talked about titles of that upcoming holiday season. It even sold well enough to crack the top five best-selling PlayStation games of the year and ended up just outside of the top 10 best-selling PS1 games of all time at the 11th spot with almost 7 million copies sold. Critically, it also got fairly high marks. Contemporary reviews show that it received a number of eight or nines out of tens and was fairly well liked by most of the people who decided to cover it. The worst review I could find for it from back in the 90s was GameSpot's fairly cynical cover coverage of it from December 1996, where a staff reviewer gave it a sort of bad, but also not too bad 6.8 out of 10. The main complaints expressed in the post primarily compared it to the recently released Super Mario 64 and lambasted it as being, quote, flat as roadkill on a four lane highway, citing the lack of plot, apparently derivative and totally not just hallmark to the genre gameplay mechanics and linear design as reasons to skip out on the game for some of the PS1s other titles. Something that I think should probably tip off the reader to the fact that the writer was suffering from a case of the not for me's more than anything. 
the game would go on to receive a couple high quality sequels from Naughty Dog, a Mario Kart and Mario Party clone, more sequels by other developers that even got multi-platform releases and would even get a crossover with Sony's other would-be mascot Spyro the Dragon on the Game Boy Advance. It's also one of the few games that are available on every PlayStation console in some way, shape, or form thanks to backwards compatibility, digital re-releases, or even its straight-up remake by Vicarious Visions in 2017's Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy. Even though the franchise has had some rough spots since its inception, people still love Crash Bandicoot for his take on platforming. Who the man? You the man. Due to coming out at a time when Mario's main rival of the decade, Sonic the Hedgehog, was mostly dead in the water as far as getting mainline entries was concerned, a lot of folks associate him with giving Nintendo's portly plumber a real run for his money and bullying him a bit in the process. The character had this grungy, tweaked out energy going for him, and he represented all there is to love about pop culture in the mid 90s. Something that a lot of people are nostalgic for these days and want to celebrate. For the longest time, my only real exposure to the character was through the Nintendo GameCube version of Crash Bandicoot Wrath of Cortex. Even though that game isn't necessarily looked back at all too fondly by Crash fans, it has a special place in my heart and I do remember it being good enough to make me want to seek out his original games. It just ended up taking me just under 20 years and a literal pandemic in order to actually do so. Kinda. In 2020, I ended up buying the Insane Trilogy for the Nintendo Switch and played through about three-fourths of the game in the process. But even though I thought the experience was fine for what it was, I still wanted to experience the original PlayStation 1 game, which took me an extra three years to actually do. So today, I'll be checking out the original Crash Bandicoot on the Sony PlayStation, as well as the Insane Trilogy version for PC and Switch because, um, when in Rome. If you're the kind of person who needs a TLDR of what I'm going to say in this video, it's basically that I was really impressed by what Crash had to offer and that I'm really glad that I finally sat down and played the original version of it. It took me on a really fun journey through time and space and gave me an experience I'm sure I won't forget. Get to playing the game already! Sheesh! I'm about to, Crash! Tell me when you've started! Is it... Is it in? I just want your first time to be special. It's important to me that you enjoy yourself. Just ask the damn question of the day. Before we continue though, a quick question of the day. Who's your favorite video game character or mascot from when you were a kid and are they still your favorite to this day? Be sure to leave your answer to the question of the day over in the comments. I'd love to hear your answer. On top of that, feel free to subscribe and share this video with your friends or anywhere you see fit if you're enjoying what you see so far, as it really goes a long way in helping the channel grow. You could also check me out on Patreon or buy me a coffee if you want some bonus goodies and want to support the channel that way too. And with that out of the way, on with the video. In order to rescue Tana from the clutches of Neo Cortex, you'll need to run through several gameplay styles spread across 32 stages. While the game is most synonymous with placing its camera behind Crash as he trudges forward through a level, it also occasionally mixes things up with bolder stages that operate a bit like auto-scrollers, 2.5D platforming levels, and even a variant of the standard stage that's an auto-scroller thanks to your riding a warthog. With the exception of that stage though, they mostly operate under the same basic rules. Run with the D-pad or analog stick, which just mirrors the D-pad's inputs and is a suboptimal way to control the character because of the dead zones involved with doing that while jumping with the X button and attacking with the square button. Throughout each of the levels, you'll find dozens of crates scattered throughout the place that can either house checkpoints, some delicious wumpa fruit to help you rack up extra lives, separate one-ups, and multiple types of tokens that could take you to a bonus stage where you can get all those aforementioned things, grab one of the game's two keys for bonus levels, find out your completion percentage, and straight up save the game. 
there's also a power up that you could score on most levels of the game in the form of an Aku Aku mask, which grants you an extra hit to keep you from dying and can also temporarily make you invincible if you collect three of them. At its core, Crash Bandicoot places a strong emphasis on linearity at the forefront of its gameplay, favoring pixel perfect platforming and the need for precise attacks on enemies to get around. For players checking out the series for the first time, this may come as a bit of a shock to them on account of how a plethora of more modern 3D platformers tends to give you a bit more square footage to run around in, as well as more to chew on in the way of branching paths, secret areas, or stuff of that nature. Now that's not to say that Crash doesn't have those things too, but rather that they're just somewhat sidelined unless you decide to go for 100% completion, which is something that I'll touch on later in the video. Touching me, just touching me. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching me. Not touching. Touching me. It's free air. Would you cut it? Without that objective in mind, Crash Bandicoot feels a lot more in line with 2D games from the era than it does three-dimensional ones that it was blazing new trails with. Much like in Super Mario World, you'll navigate your way to a stage on a map that sprawls several islands in order to enter stages that you can complete by reaching a goal. Every so often, you'll run into a boss with a specific pattern you'll need to figure out in order to beat them, then you'll be back to running through some more stages until you reach Embryo and End Cortex to annihilate them. It's all clear-cut stuff and not that far removed from what was going on in the genre just before 3D titles shook things up a bit, and it works fine because of it. I especially liked how things feel motivated by your environments and stuff like the boulder and hog stages where you're constantly running because you're being chased Indiana Jones style or because you're riding a wild beast. If it sounds like I'm making the game out to be a simple point A to B affair, it's because I am. But that's actually something that I absolutely love about it. It's got the arcadey approach to game design down by making it easy to pick up and difficult to master. Really hard to master. In fact, if what I read online was accurate, the first Crash Bandicoot might actually be the hardest in the series' original Naughty Dog run, which makes its simple controls and gameplay a bit deceiving. What I'm trying to say is that you're gonna wanna stop and break every box you can because stocking up on lives will quite literally save your life in the game. By the time you get to the end of this thing, you're gonna see an Amazon delivery person walking up to your door and you're gonna turn into this bloodthirsty hound and sink your teeth into him before he dares rummage through your property. Naughty Dog goes really out of their way to throw extra lives at you in this game too, which is largely due to the challenge that many of the game's levels will pose to you. I won't go as far as to call Crash 1 an extremely difficult game if you're just trying to get the regular ending, but it's definitely gonna ruffle some feathers during your playthrough. In conjunction to the tons of regular boxes on each stage are gonna be some dangerous TNT boxes that can insta-kill you if you aren't wearing an Aku Aku mask. It leads to a fairly decent workout for your executive function because they often will have a box nested below or atop them containing some wumpa fruit or lives for you. Because of this, you'll need to decide whether or not you want to thread the needle and try to get the item without setting off the TNT box and killing yourself. Uh oh. Of course, you realize this means war. You can also bounce off of those boxes in order to start a three second timer before they explode too, which can make things a bit more tense for you. Besides that though, this is all fairly cut and dry platforming. Now to be clear, I'm not saying that's a bad thing or anything, but laid out in its separate parts, I could kinda see where that GameSpot review I mentioned at the top of this video is coming from. That said, this obviously didn't stop the game from doing gangbusters in stores and becoming a fixture across the childhoods of millions of young PlayStation owners. I'd even argue that it may have been a part of why the game works as well as it does. Crash Bandicoot just feels... clean. There's a certain effortlessness to its level designs and the way that it pulls things off that not only fits the apathetic as hell era it came out in, but also elevates the material of the game itself. Part of Crash's marketing campaign in the US centered around how he was this kind of belligerent jerk ass that hassled people about how good his game is, and after a bit of time with the game itself, it's somewhat clear why they went with this direction for promoting it. It makes the game even cooler to be as fun as it is while appearing nonchalant about how easy it was to go toe to toe with the competition. 
Like, you know, whatever. And it's even a bit ironic how it does this too, because as detailed in an excellent video by Ars Technica with one of Naughty Dog's co-founders, Crash 1 was basically a hack job that had to creatively leverage the PlayStation's hardware to work in the first place. It's literally one-to-one -one with that cool Lisa clip I just screened because seconds before she fired off that line with casual disaffection, she was also hiding and rehearsing it. I do feel like a lot of Crash Bandicoot's difficulty is fairly easy to stomach though. Some of the harder moments definitely got on my nerves and stuff, but the vast majority of it comes across as being fairly innocuous on account of how short many of its levels are and how there were checkpoints and stages as well as so many lives for you to pick up. The most common issue I encountered in this game stemmed from the camera placement and how, especially coupled with the PlayStation 1's resolution, it made gauging some of the distance between your jumps involve just a bit too much guesswork. The lack of analog control doesn't particularly help here either, though that's also excusable since the PS1 didn't even have an analog stick on its default controller at the time. Even the camera stuff is mostly fine. I mean, Super Mario 64 helped innovate 3D camera control and that game literally came out a month after Crash was publicly showcased at E3. It also isn't really the type of game that really needs fine camera control either due to its heavily 2D inspired design. Besides the fact that the game has straight up 2.5D levels, it's basically just a 2D platformer played on the Z axis. There are secrets to be uncovered by those of you with prying eyes and stuff, but the levels are more interested in giving you traditional platforming challenges in a new way than it is with trying to break away from what was still the genre's predominant mode of play in 1996. The Super Mario Bros. series has come up a few times in this video already, and for good reason. The games, namely Super Mario World, definitely influenced how Crash Bandicoot was structured, and Crash was naturally compared to Nintendo's recent blockbuster Buster released Super Mario 64 on account of how both games were polygonal capers for the era's latest game boxes. But here's the thing, we could probably skip out on comparing Crash to Mario in the first place and instead actually compare it to the game that was a bigger influence on its design, Donkey Kong Country. Much like Rare's iconic trilogy of SNES pushing games, they both feature strong jungle aesthetics in their graphics, a high difficulty curve, and they even give the player vaguely similar movesets in the form of Crash's jump and spin attack landing fairly close to what you'd get in DKC. The Warthog levels even directly recall the animal companions in that series and their minecart stages too. Basically, Crash Bandicoot plays more like a 3D Donkey Kong Country than Rare's own 3D Donkey Kong game does. Though it does also lack the super cool rap that game had, so yeah, I mean, it is worse. Morpheus, Dorpheus, Morpheus, go eat some Warruses. Red pill, blue pill, Morpheus, Warruses. Drinking a 40 in a death basket. Ah. Seriously though, the similarities between these two games are pretty striking. There's Candy Kong and Tana, who are both Donkey Kong and Crash's respective and very sexualized partners, and coincidentally gatekeep save points in the first games of both franchises. There's the fact that the boss encounters get their own dedicated stages versus coming at the end of a more normal one like in Super Mario World, and the fact that both games even place their collectibles within barrels and crates for you to destroy, which is, like, basically the same thing. If you want to go the extra mile, there's even a monkey in Crash 1 that does a role that's very similar to the one that DK does in his own game. I think that both games also employ a similar emphasis on being patient as opposed to just sprinting to the finish line like you can often do in a Mario game. Without a time limit in their stages or any incentive to roll around at the speed of sound, you're more often than not better off just taking your time memorizing an obstacle's pattern than you are just trying to brute force your way through things like your Iggy Pop and the Stooges performing raw power. That's not to say that I think Crash is a Donkey Kong Country knockoff or anything though, just that they have a lot in common. However, if I were to say that, I'd also add that I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Oh, sorry, one sec. Okay, where were we? If you're curious as to why that's the case though, I highly recommend checking out my last video where I discussed a Legend of Zelda clone for the Sega Genesis and why I think the clone titles like it can be a valuable addition to any gamer's library. 
To me, it was just fascinating to see what Naughty Dog was able to do with the blueprint laid out by Nintendo's series that was itself designed to ward off the competition on bigger and better hardware. Speaking of hardware, I should probably get to how the game looks and runs. I already touched on how some of the camera placement can lead to depth perception and the like being trickier than it is to beat Run DMC in a race through a corn maze, so I won't bring that up again right now, but it's worth mentioning all of the game's accomplishments that surround that. For starters, Crash Bandicoot runs at a solid 30 frames per second. I mean, it might have a dip here or there, but it usually does a good job of sticking to its intended frame rate and plays much smoother than a a lot of the games it was put up against back in the day. Because of this, you'll feel pretty in control of your movements. That lock frame rate is also a huge part of why a lot of your deaths you'll experience during your playthrough felt so understandable. If you die playing Crash Bandicoot, you're more likely to take it out on yourself with a quick and succinct Damn. than you are to blame the game itself. Crash is a really fun character to see in motion on account of his exaggerated physical proportions, bright orange fur that makes it easy to see him at all times, and the litany of facial expressions and animations you'll see during your playthrough. Seeing his death will be a fairly common occurrence for first time players, Naughty Dog gave you a ton of zany and cartoony death animations to watch depending on how you died. It gives the game a lot of personality and helps elevate the lunacy of the world he inhabits to the level of a cartoon. And in case you didn't see what I just did there, I'd say it makes the game feel a bit like a product of the Looney Tunes. It's got the cartoony violence and love for explosives of a Wile E. Coyote short, directly recalls the Tasmanian Devil's spin with Crash's attack, and has a roster of strange and fantastic bosses that are as loony as they get. Hell, for all I know, part of Dr. Neo Cortex's inspiration may have been the Peter Lore homage Dr. Lore, who has similarly ghastly yellow skin in the 1946 short Hair Raising Hair and is shown to love performing experiments on anthropomorphic animals in the 1947 cartoon Birth of a Notion. Quit stalling! Um, what? Get back to the reveal before I whip up a mob and show you an homage to Frankenstein being burnt to death in a windmill fire. <laughs> it's actually a common misconception. You see, what I think you were trying to say is that you'd show me an homage to Frankenstein's monster. Hey, neighbors! Point taken. What I was trying to get at was the fact that Crash is a visual feast on the eyes. It's got a ton of character in its environments and it's characters and it makes running around these environments a ton of fun. I especially love the stages that took place during a sunset because of how dreamlike and overly nostalgic it felt. You know how people tend to make these liminal space posts on TikTok or Instagram these days and set it to aquatic ambience from Donkey Kong Country? Well, that's the exact vibe I got from that saturated red and orange sunset aesthetic. It's so freaking 90s and how chunky and saturated the colors are and how limited the dynamic range of the colors and their gradient being rendered are. I love it. I feel like it's something we started to lose sometime following the turn of the century as hardware became more powerful and we eventually started to adopt HD resolutions and more advanced technology. If I had to nitpick though, I guess the game does kinda stick to the same visual motifs throughout its run a bit too much for its own good. A lot of the stages start to blend together after a while in a way that doesn't necessarily diminish my enjoyment of them or anything, but does leave me wondering what other environments could have looked like. And you could raise the argument that yeah, that's exactly what the sequels are for, but that doesn't really change the fact that I wanted the variety in this game. Also, Crash Bandicoot's art style does tend to pull quite a bit from Polynesian, various African and West Indie cultures in order to create its own non-specific amalgam of them, which might come across as a bit dated and maybe just a bit offensive for newer players. I'm personally torn on how I feel about this because while I definitely feel that we shouldn't raise Naughty Dog for, and let's just call it what it is, cultural appropriation, I also don't see much point in dredging it up since the game is around 25 years old. 
I know we're still getting new Crash games and stuff to this day, in fact I think one's actually coming out this month, so I'm not particularly thrilled about it, but I also think that, at least based off what I've seen from the series in recent years, that they've gotten a lot better about handling those cultural influences. I could get into a whole thing discussing my feelings on this stuff and whether or not I think it crosses the line of being cultural appropriation versus just taking inspiration from another culture, but honestly, it's not really in the scope of this video, nor do I think the ensuing argument in the comments section from people on both sides of the line would be worth it. Whatever you do want to call it though, it's there, some of it isn't great, and that's about all we can say about it. At least it isn't that Dr. Mario Game Boy commercial with the Witch Doctor in it, and that things have generally gotten better since then because, yikes, that one's pretty bad. Even if the song is really catchy. So, I can wear my hula outfit if I'm honoring Hawaiians. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you feel like it's about honoring the culture and not just to look sexy. Yep, I'm honoring the culture. Right. Have you been wearing that under your shirt all day? Yeah, I don't know how you do it. At the end of the day though, it is gorgeous. In terms of its employment of 3D graphics, Crash Bandicoot doesn't disappoint. Even though the game's resolution is pitifully low for modern standards, things are clearly represented and readable thanks to the bold color choices in the stages themselves. They also just have a nice charm to them for the same reason that the aforementioned sunset was so overdrive for me. Part of the fun of playing retro games in the first place is indulging in a bit of nostalgia for the era the game came out in. A good retro game is more than just a fun smattering of pixels, bleeps, and bloops. It's also something that's so powerful that it could literally just make you long for an idealized and simple version of the era it was created in. What I'm trying to say is, even though I didn't play this game back in the 90s, it makes me wish I could return to the simple joys of a pre-war on terror, pre-Monica Lewinsky scandal breaking America. A world where the biggest thing on my mind would have been if I wanted to keep watching Carolyn in the City in order to see if it crossed over with friends again or if I wanted to get a PlayStation as opposed to an N64. Even upscaled to 720p or 1080p, which I tested out for about half of a playthrough of the game, it still looks pretty great. Polygonal assets are obviously a lot sharper, the graphics still maintain a lot of their retro charm, and it may even be a bit easier to play the game this way since it'll make seeing where you're going clearer. I definitely prefer the game with its original chonkier art as opposed to the slicker upscaled art, but I still think it looks pretty good this way. Musically, this game doesn't disappoint either. I mean, we obviously all know that its theme slaps harder than Sylvester Stallone does after turning his hat backwards in 1987's Over the Top, but the rest of the soundtrack goes just as hard. It incorporates a ton of percussion in order to tap into the game's cultural influences that I mentioned earlier, and basically works in the same way that a kick drum does in some late 90s electronic music. Which is something that the soundtrack also incorporates a few elements of in its later stages, riffing off of the genre and melding it with the cartoony stylings that the rest of the OST has to great effect. It all appropriately pumps you up and makes you want to push through the levels. There's also just something to the game's use of MIDI and synthesized instruments too. Besides being nostalgic like the graphics are, it enhances the cartooniness of everything around it. The music feels more video gamey due to how uncanny it sounds and that just works really well given the heightened and loony aesthetic of the game itself. Pound for pound, Crash Bandicoot is genuinely great. The action's fun and engaging, it's a relatively short game if you're just going for finishing the story, and it manages to leave you clamoring for more action by the end of things. It seems a bit like its direct sequels get a bit more love from fans on account of how comparatively bare bones this first game was, but I didn't really mind it. If anything, it just makes me excited to pick up and play through the second and third game one of these days. I'm also just kinda kicking myself for waiting this long to play the game in general too, because yeah, it was really that fun. Was it perfect? No, not really, but then again, I can't think of many games that are. That said, there is one itty bitty thing that I wanted to talk about. It's a small gripe, if you could even really call it one, but I thought it was worth bringing up nonetheless. 
Like I said earlier, Crash Bandicoot is known for being the hardest game in Naughty Dog's original trilogy. And while I'm sure that some of that comes down to them just learning their way through the hardware and not fully knowing what made for good or necessarily quote unquote fair game design at points, there's also no ignoring the fact that they leaned in on this idea to some degree. Because yeah, the DKC influence on this game makes it fairly clear that Naughty Dog had at least some intention of testing the player's patience while they worked their way through Crash as three islands. And even though the game isn't impossibly difficult or anything, and the developers actually included quite a few ways to try and keep you from rage quitting, there's no doubt in my mind that they also kinda tried to be dicks about it in a playful negging kinda way. A way that, at least somewhat, feels a bit like bullying in hindsight. Huh. I guess he doesn't really mind being called a- You think I'm a bully? There it is. Now, obviously, when I say the Crash Bandicoot's a bully, I'm being hyperbolic. I don't think the game is literally being abusive or trying to mug you of your lunch money. I just spent the past 30 minutes singing the game's praises. So I'm clearly not trying to compare it to Biff Tannen or Angelica Pickles. It's more of a light bully, if anything, that means well enough, but doesn't always realize it's being a dick like Michael Scott or Johnny Lawrence post-redemption in Cobra Kai. What is the problem, Mr. Diaz? No problem, Sensei. You, you punch me. I have asthma, so... Not anymore. I'm just trying to use language in a creative way to make the point that the game hits difficult. Not different, although it does that too, but difficult. The game is difficult. And with that in mind, I think calling it a bully is a fairly apt descriptor for the first Crash Bandicoot, because it totally loves to drag you through the mud all while smugly preparing to goad you into a false sense of safety again afterwards. It's basically the equivalent to Lucy trolling Charlie Brown with the football in old Peanuts comic strips. As far as the base experience goes, this can be found in the way that the game loves to throw gauntlet after gauntlet of platforming challenges your way that require pinpoint accuracy. What's worse, these moments can come out of nowhere on account of some poor difficulty scaling on the parts of the levels themselves. One level might find you practically prancing your way to the goal only to have you memorize the layout of obstacles in a boulder stage afterwards in order to avoid dying. Then you might mostly get through another level without many issues only to end up losing a dozen or more of your lives trying to wiggle your way through a single challenge at the end of it. And once you do get through it, the game just hands you a few extra lives as it tries to make up for the absolute torture it just put you through. They may as well just pull a BP from South Park and, um, real life, I guess, and just throw a half-assed apology our way too while they're at it. Sorry. Some of its balance and pacing issues spill over into the boss battles too. A fair number of them aren't hard at all, but every so often you'll run into one that may just throw you for a loop. For instance, Ripper Roo can go f himself. While the actual fight against the jackass is fine enough, the placement of the camera can make it super easy to misjudge the distance you need to jump from one platform to another. Even in something like the remake, I must have gone through 10 to 20 lives in that boss battle alone because, yeah, I just kept drowning. And like, outside of that one problem with the fight, it really isn't that hard. It mostly just comes down to the camera angle we have over the action being a difficult one to parse information from. But I still find it somewhat hard to hold it against the game on account of how generous it is with all the extra lives. I won't deny that it's a bit of a cop out to just throw extra lives at the player after a randomly hard section and that it also kind of makes me feel a bit like Stella from Tennessee Williams' A Streetcar Named Desire in the process, but it does theoretically let younger and more casual players hopefully make some progress through the game. However, that's also assuming those players are probably emulating the game or going with the Vicarious Visions remake on account of how saving worked in the original release and kinda sucked. In order to save in the original PS1 game, you'll need to collect three boxes with Tana's mug on them in order to get whisked away into a bonus room. From there, you'll need to get through the room without dying in order to reach your girlfriend who's standing in front of a portal. She'll then get taken away from you and you'll be given the opportunity to save or copy down a password and get on with things. The game also technically saves whenever you get a gem for a stage, though that only actually saves the fact that you've collected a gem and not your actual stage progress. 
In other words, it's entirely possible to get through huge swaths of the game without hitting a save point. In fact, if you aren't going for completion and just want to experience all the levels and reach the credits, there's going to be sections of your adventure where you probably won't get to save for a bit. Which kinda sucks if you ask me. I mean, the fact that you can find multiple threads from over the years asking how saving works, only to have some of the replies in those threads need to be clarified over the difference between saving gems and progress is a testament to how this was a flawed system. As is the fact that the Insane Trilogy had to change it so that you can now save at any time between levels and added auto-saving. Imagine if you were on your last life or two, getting absolutely decimated by a challenge you didn't see coming and had to carry the knowledge that you hadn't saved in a while too on top of that. Wouldn't you be pretty terrified of getting a game over? If I was in that situation, I'd practically tiptoe through the stages too afraid to do anything even approaching risky gameplay, which I believe would have made it harder for me to enjoy the game as a whole. What am I doing? Skill issue. Okay, but if the so-called skill issue actually impedes people from enjoying the game, then you can't really consider- Skill issue, get good! But it really isn't a skill issue, Crash. And plus, just telling people to get good at a game isn't a good way to actually critique anything. You're just hand-waving away valid criticism of the game's design. If anything, you should welcome the criticism because it allows us to talk about the thing with some level of nuance. I disagree! If you have a problem with that, you can come out here and fight me, Niche! But you won't, and you wanna know why? Let me guess, because I'd lose on account of a- A massive gaping skill issue, correct mundo. Oh, there it is! There it is! You're a tough guy to like, Crash! That's a skill issue! Put together, the uneven pacing of the adventure and the convoluted means of saving made Crash Bandicoot a bit of a pain at times. And that's where I feel like the bullying comparison really comes into play. The core game is so fun that whenever you run into any difficulty spikes or roadblocks, you just want to brute force your way past them so that you could get back to the good stuff. It's this weird cyclical pattern where you let the game drive you up a wall, or literally let a wall shove you off a level. And by the way, this is all without accounting for trying to 100% the game. I almost never care to go for completion in most of the games I play, so you could take this with a grain of salt if you want, but Crash's prerequisites for completing things are genuinely nuts. First, you'll need to collect two keys that are only available on the second island stage, Sunset Vista, as well as on the third island's level, Jaws of Darkness. Then, you'll need to go through each of the 32 levels in the game, excluding bosses, and break every crate in them so that you can nab that stage's gem. Which is where things get dicey. Other than the fact that this sorta of challenge sounds more like an urban legend to unlock Sonic the Hedgehog as a playable character than it does an actual prereq for beating the game, it calls for an insane upshot in skill for a reward that dwarfs the challenge in its payoff. Because if you do manage to pull it all off, you basically just get a cutscene once you follow a path that opens up in the otherwise over the second it started stage, the Great Hall. Which is cool, yeah, but feels a bit underwhelming. It's especially brutal because in order to break every box in a given stage, you'll have to go through it without dying. On top of that, you'll also need to find the game's six colored gems which are used to open secret paths in other levels, meaning that you'll be jumping all over the map trying to figure out what goes where and what order you should do it in. And that's where things just start to feel cruel. For the sake of the review, I ended up 100%ing the game for myself, and while I did end up finding the experience a lot less monotonous than it sounded on paper, I also couldn't shake the feeling that the reward for all this extra work made it far from worthwhile. It's hardly deal breaking or anything since this is technically side content that was there explicitly for players looking for a little something extra, and it was fun, but it also felt a little pointless. There were also just a few too many instances where you'd either die at the last second or get to the end of a level and find out you were missing the proper gem needed to get the last crate to make it feel particularly gratifying. Seeing as this game is rated K through A and all, it definitely feels like it was done more for the A's than the K's, and when taken away, I'm okay with that.
That rhymes. On some level, this really does just come with the territory though, you know? Games were harder back in the day, and without feeling the need to prescribe some maxim to it that they don't make them like they used to, or that kids playing video games are being coddled, or whatever other culture war adjacent hogwash people like to apply to blips and bloops on a monitor, we can just admit that it's a part of Crash Bandicoot for better or for worse. The difficulty of the game, it's nowadays rudimentary, but trailblazing back then visuals and the wacky attitude of the world itself are a product of the 90s. Which is great! I love the 90s! I know I was only born in 1995, but a lot of my favorite pop culture stems back to that era. I mean, I literally wrote this part of the script while listening to Amy Mann's early solo albums after Till Tuesday broke up for crying out loud. It's awesome to be able to go back to Crash 1 and to engage with it in its full mid-90s glory. But what about its remake in the Insane Trilogy? What does that game do in order to preserve the original Crash Bandicoot's charm while simultaneously updating some of its more curmudgeon -y details? In June 2017, the PS4 received Vicarious Visions, Crash Bandicoot, and Sane Trilogy as a timed exclusive, with the Xbox One, Windows, and the Nintendo Switch receiving a port a day short of a full year later. The Insane Trilogy contains remakes of Crash 1 through 3 and has been done with a new engine, brand new graphics, and even the level Stormy Ascent, which was a level that had been removed from the original game short of using a GameShark code in favor of an easier version of it for the final release. When it first came out, the Insane Trilogy received fairly strong reviews across the board with the Switch version getting the most vocal complaints over an alleged frame or two of extra input lag that the other versions lacked. By and large though, people loved the remakes and thought that they did justice to the character with the only notable exception being, well... GameSpot! It was GameSpot! They gave the original game a 6.8 out of 10 back in the 90s, and then the entire Insane Trilogy a 6 out of 10 in 2017. What? I know, right? Like I previously stated, the Nintendo Switch release of the Insane Trilogy was actually the first way I ever played Crash 1. I picked it up back in April or May of 2020 while it was on sale, and I ended up playing through most of it using a mix of my Nintendo Switch Pro controller, the SN30 Pro I lost after I threw it a Bale of Lugosi back in my Zombies Ate My Neighbor video and a Sega Saturn wireless controller that I also had at the time. And if you're wondering why I'm listing all the controllers I used, well, I'll explain that in just a sec. As far as remakes of classic 90s platformers go, the Insane Trilogy is a pretty tough act to follow. Despite its flaws, it's a gorgeous reinterpretation of the PS1 originals, and focusing on the first game since it's the only one I've played through and the one I'm reviewing today after all, includes a ton of updates to make it more approachable to newcomers. Aside from the obvious graphical overhaul and higher resolution, the game now auto-saves between levels, it allows you to retry bonus rooms after you fail them, and you can still collect gems after dying during a stage. There are also tiny but not insignificant changes to the general user experience, such as being able to check how many boxes are left in a stage and the prerequisite number of jumps needed to destroy a reinforced one being dropped from 10 jumps to 5. You can even play as Crash's sister Coco now. She controls just like Crash and is more of a skin than a unique character, but it's still super cool to see how the option worked its way into the final release. In layman's terms, the Insane Trilogy version to Crash 1 is a slicker, polished version of the original game that maintains the difficulty found there and a decent amount of its charm without making it strictly for people who have stuck by the character since 1996. When it first came out, the game was the subject of several articles that quoted devs and claimed that each of the remakes were actually harder than the originals on account of some changes made during development. In conjunction to some tweaks to the physics and the general weightier jumps that were made, Vicarious Visions also went ahead and gave Crash a rounded hitbox as opposed to the flat one he had back in the PS1 days. This basically means that you'll need to be a bit more precise in your jumps and that grazing the edges of platforms will lead to you slipping to your death, unlike in the original. It sounds like a small change, but for a game that's built around the pillar of tight platforming, it can definitely make certain parts of the adventure harder than they were previously. Which 
which is why I made a point to mention the controllers I used earlier, because you're gonna definitely want to use a good D-pad to play this thing and consider skipping out on using an analog stick entirely since the game doesn't have analog input to begin with. While the same thing holds true to the PS1 game, it goes doubly so for the remake due to this change in hitboxes, as well as the Nintendo Switch version running at a sometimes shaky 30 FPS with extra input lag. In the case of my playthrough back in 2020, I was most happy with the Saturn pad on account of just liking the huge primary buttons it has and how they were level with the controller's infamously good D-pad. However, I also liked using stuff like 8BitDo's SN30 series controllers or their Sega-inspired M30. Literally anything other than the Nintendo Switch Pro controller should work because even though it's one of my favorite controllers of all time, it also has one of the worst D-pads I've ever seen, which is especially bad since the company that made it literally invented them to begin with. That said, I do think it's a bit of an overstatement to call it a harder game than the original because while the game may make things more difficult to work with in that sense, a lot's also been done to make things more accommodating. For starters, it has a dynamic difficulty setting added to it from the second and third game that gives you an extra hit if you keep dying and adds extra checkpoints to the level for you if you continue to lose lives anyway. Additionally, thanks to the much more lenient save system, you don't need to worry about losing tons of your progress progress at any given moment, and loading screens now give you tips. Besides that though, it's basically just Crash Bandicoot with a fresh coat of paint. It's missing stuff like the password system, and it has physics that are supposedly more in line with Crash 2 than anything, but it's still the same game where it counts. Even though I think the Nintendo Switch version is probably the worst way to experience Crash 1 these days, it's still adequate enough. It's just that now, with streaming games from your PC or consoles becoming more accessible as a usable option for some players, I feel like you might be better off going down that route to play the Insane Trilogy. If it's within your means, doing that will guarantee that you get to play through the remake in the highest resolution possible and with higher quality textures. Heck, if you have the Steam Deck, you could straight up just run the trilogy off of that thing instead. As for which version of Crash Bandicoot I prefer, I've gotta hand it to the original, because while the remake is really, really fun, the 90s nostalgia of the PS1 version makes it perfect. I didn't even grow up with Crash Bandicoot in the same way that a lot of other people have. I just think it's a really good game from an era that I generally have a lot of affection for. The mid to late 90s low poly aesthetic is one of my favorite looks and it's something that I'm constantly clamoring for more of. So getting to experience this for the first time was genuinely a treat for me because of how thoroughly it pulled me back 25 years in time. So while a part of me wishes I could have played this game back when it came out or with my buddy Mike as kids in the early to mid 2000s as this was one of his favorite games of all time and he loved to brag about how he could still get his scratched and chipped up copy to run without issues, I'm also just just glad to have gotten to play it at all, and to play it as an adult that's fully able to appreciate it too for that matter. So there you have it, Crash Bandicoot is pretty awesome. The visuals and music are everything I expected them to be, with a little extra nostalgia thrown in for good measure too, and the gameplay is super addictive. The best compliment I could give the game is that even though I literally played through most of it like four or five times in preparation for this video, I was ready to go back in and just start playing its sequels almost immediately. On top of that, even though I didn't care for the reward I got for 100%ing the game, and I don't usually enjoy 100%ing games to begin with, I had a lot of fun mastering each of Crash 1's levels and I might end up doing the same thing with each of its sequels someday. Is it over? Is he gone? Nope, just had to swap out the batteries. Play Crash 2. Play Crash 2. Play Crash 2. Play Crash 2. Say hey. Hey. Say ho. Ho. Say niche. Niche. Play Crash 2. Play Crash 2. Anyway, that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it and that if you did, you leave a like on it or a comment and answer to the question of the day and that you share it with three friends you think will really enjoy it too or something. Why three? Because I, I don't know. There's a lot going on. Can't you just cut me some slack?
You could also follow me on Patreon or buy me a coffee if you want to do things that way and get a couple of bonus goodies in the process. Oh yeah, there's also the usual social media stuff you could follow me on by following the links in the pinned comment or in the description to this video. So yeah, bye.